Hi, welcome to our midweek Bible study. It is January 11th, 2023. And uh, by way of prayer request, we do want to be uh, praying for uh, the Clinton family as uh, Carrie passed away a week ago today. Uh, we want to keep uh, particularly Jim in prayer and uh, family. We want to also um, uh, pray for... Uh, Andy Vaughn's family, that is uh, Katie, uh, Tasson, and Kelly Burnett's um, <clears throat> brother. And it, he's been pretty faithful to the church and and both him and Carrie um, surely knew the Lord and we are grateful for their uh, salvation and the confidence we have that when we're absent from the body as believers we are present with the lord but just be praying for the family it's a tough time for them uh joe alexander we were praying for him he had a couple surgeries over the weekend and i uh, talked to him yesterday uh, through text and he's doing well he's doing well hoping to go home soon so I'll continue to pray for him and uh just continue to pray for planada and areas in merced and the grand um with the flooding and uh Pastor Rick from uh, Planada Community. He hasn't been back uh, yet, but he was evacuated yesterday along with most of the town, if not all the town. And uh, so there's some car damage, home damage, and, and other things that, that they may be going back to. So we want to keep our, our uh, neighbors in prayer there. And, and uh, uh, we thought we were going to have a little bit of flooding yesterday here in the Grand and uh, God... Uh, intervene and we want to continue to pray for that uh, but lord will be done we're thankful for the rain but but not thankful for the flooding so we just continue to pray there uh, so let's pray heavenly father we thank you lord for your direction your word we pray for the clintons and for andy's family lord we pray for carrie's family and those losses are difficult we want to pray for joe as he recovers from the surgery uh, we want to pray for those that have been affected by the flooding as they return to their homes in the next day or two, Lord, and uh, not really knowing what they're going to find. We pray for Planata Community Church and pray there's not too much damage down in the basement and just continue to pray for Pastor Rick as he leads the people there. Uh, pray for our lesson today, Lord. It's another good one. Uh, help us to glean from it, Lord, a lot of different things that we could uh, be encouraged by or convicted by. So. Lord, your will be done with these scriptures in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we're going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 9. And this is the, uh, it's been an uh, interesting study. As, as you go through these uh, midweek Bible studies, what we're doing is we're walking through the Old Testament. We started this years ago. Um, and this last year or so longer, uh, we've been in... Uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and they cover a lot of the same things, but with a little different bent to them, a little different uh, emphasis. And we'll see the same thing today, <clears throat> as uh, Chapter Nine actually ends our study in Chronicles on Solomon. Uh, we left last week, ended with Chapter Eight. And um, we just talked about last week the the compromise of Solomon and in chapter eight, verse eleven was the the emphasis of that when he uh, had this wife that was the daughter of Pharaoh that he didn't feel was was uh, holy enough to dwell in the house of David where the ark was. So we see that compromise that he knows this this woman is not. Uh, acceptable to God, but he continues to uh, uh, marry these women from foreign countries. And they do, at the end of his life, turn him away from God. Um, and we saw him uh, complete the temple, and um, then he begins to accumulate gold towards the end of chapter 8. And uh, we talked a little bit last week about our position in the world as God's royal priesthood, according to um, Peter, the chosen generation, a peculiar people. We find that all in First Peter chapter 2. Um, and that Solomon was a king, so he was very 
uh, focused on the, the, the problems of the world, the materialistic things of the world, the building, and a lot of chapter eight is just about the things that he built. And we're going to continue that thought today. And I want you to think about, as we look into chapter nine, uh, wealth versus wisdom. Um, uh, the Bible, all the, through it, has this principle of, you know, not to seek to be rich. You, nothing wrong with being rich. But if that is your goal uh, to accumulate wealth, even Solomon himself talks about the vanity of it in Ecclesiastes. And we are told the love of money is the root of all evil. And so um, we're going to see in chapter 9 this contradiction between wealth and wisdom and how only wisdom, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So when I talk about wisdom, it's always in connection to the wisdom of God, the wisdom of scriptures. And so as we see that today, um, we are hopefully blessed by it and, and understand it, that our treasure is not in material things. You're, the treasure that we have is, is God's word and our salvation and our knowledge that when we're absent from the body, we are present with the Lord. So this all begins in chapter 9 with a woman who visits Solomon. And it says in chapter 9, verse 1 of Second Chronicles, uh, The queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon. She came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions, having a very great retinue. That word retinue, uh, a word we might use today with the young vernacular would be a posse, if they still use that word, I don't know. But it's basically uh, all of her. Uh, minions, all of those who serve her, all of those. So there's a great many people that came along with her. Probably imagine the picture of them carrying her or that kind of thing. Um, so she had a great retinue. She had camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him all that was in her heart. So th the question right here is what is she doing there? What drove her um, to come to Solomon? And um, there is a very common thing here. Solomon's wisdom, uh, we're going to see in a later verse, it was widely known. And people came from all over uh, to get his a view on different things, his opinion on different things, just to see the incredible riches that he had. And God in scripture um, isolates this queen for us. And she visits and uh, she had something in her heart that had dr driven him to the wisdom of Solomon. Um, and so I want to take a parallel with this message that the same type of drive that people had um, is the same drive that people have when they come to Jesus. Uh, the Bible says, Jesus, no one comes to me unless my father draws him. And, and there is this idea of wanting people to come and see for themselves what Jesus. Now, um, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 24 says this, all the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. Each man brought his present articles of silver and gold, garments, armor, spices, horses, and mules at a set rate year by year. So, so basically people came with riches and wealth uh, to kind of purchase the wisdom of Solomon. Uh, and they came to see, the Bible says very clearly, 1 Kings 10, 24, all the earth sought the presence of Solomon. And there are those who seek wisdom. And every once in a while, someone is drawn to the wisdom of God. The Bible says, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. So our responsibility of preaching the word and, and God 
gives the illustration of seeds, planting and watering and harvest, Lord. And we, we, when we preach or we share the gospel or we put a verse online or we do anything that, that, that gets the word of God forward, um, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. And so we are those that, that the Holy Spirit uses through faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God uh, to get the word out. And then those who are being drawn, like the Queen of Sheba, like the Ethiopian, when, when he rode on his carriage and, and, and Philip was able to catch up with him and, and share the gospel with him in the book of Acts. Um, it is random to us, not to God, but there are these pre-planned uh, uh, moments of visitation with God and the Holy Spirit with people. Uh, let me show you how it works in uh, John chapter one. Let's turn there. Again, we're talking about this idea of, of coming and seeing how great God is. This draw that people would have to Jesus or to the gospel that the Bible speaks about through the Holy Spirit. So in John chapter one, uh, let's go ahead and begin in verse 35. This is very early in Jesus' ministry. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, John 135. Looking at Jesus, he walked, as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. This is after the baptism. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, seeing them following, said to them, what do you seek? So these are the two disciples that John, you know, points to Jesus, you know, he, I must increase, he must decrease. So they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when it's just translated teacher, where are you staying? So we're just, they don't know anything yet. They're just drawn to this Jesus uh, through the words of John the Baptist. So he said to them, come and see. And this is really the three words I want all of us to kind of hone in on today, that that's some of the most powerful testimony that we can give to anybody is, is come and see. Um, that doesn't always mean uh, we'll come to church. It also doesn't mean, you know, come to um, um, Bible study. Uh, sometimes it might mean, you know, come to lunch and let's sit and talk. Or uh, here's a, a New Testament for you, or the book of John. And if we can get people just to even read the book of John, it's quite remarkable, <laughs> that book, what it does. And so it's the idea of, of just encouraging people to, before they make a judgment about God, or about the scriptures, or about the, the salvation, that just look for themselves. Give God the same, you know, we, we've been hearing through this last few years in dealing with the COVID issue and, and the tremendous debate about it is, is people do your research, get the information, do your research. And, and we would tell the world that about Jesus, you know, don't listen to what everybody is saying. Go get your Bibles or find a Bible and read it for yourself. And if, if you're one who is a skeptic, then, then you, okay, I'm going to do it. Where do I start? Well, you start in the book of John. And if you don't want to read the whole book, read John chapter 3. And if you don't want to read the whole chapter, read John chapter 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. There's the gospel in there. The gospel is about love. The world is mankind. Mankind is filled with sin. From the moment Adam ate that fruit, the Bible says in Romans 5 that his sin, the sin of man, is passed to every single human being. And that as a result, in Romans 3.23, we, we are all sinners. Nobody's perfect. Um, but Romans 6.23 says the wages or the payment from sin is, is death. And that word death means to be separate 
from God. So sin separates us from God. And uh, right now on earth, we're separate from the spirit and we don't really have the, the presence of God within us. But if you die without Christ and you're eternally separated from God, who will be in glory in the new heavens and the new earth, uh, while those who rejected him will be separate in a place of torment. Uh, but the rest of Romans 6.23 says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, so even though there is, we're all sinners and the payment is death, there is a, a fix. There is a way to be saved. And that way to be saved, Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his love towards us, that love of John 3.16, that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the payment is death. Jesus dies on the cross and he becomes sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin becomes sin for us. He's buried uh, as, a, uh, as a substitution for us, but he does something we could never do. He defeats death. He defeats sin and he rises again the third day. That's the Easter story. And Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, he's risen from the dead, you will be saved. So that's the gospel. Uh, the question is, uh, do we believe it? Is it real? Well, just come and see. Come and see the book of John, John chapter 3 or John chapter 3, 16. And if you're wondering how to witness to somebody, that would be a great way. Just say, come and see. Go read the book of John. Go read. The word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It will make a difference to those who God is drawing. So Jesus says in John 1, 39, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So now we get the name of one of those two that John the Baptist pointed towards Jesus. And he just happened to be the brother of Peter himself. So verse 41, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. What's interesting is they have first identified Jesus as a rabbi or a teacher, but now he has realized he's the Messiah. He came, he saw and he was transformed. So he does the same to his brother, and he brings him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, you're Simon, the son of Jonah. You should be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me, come and see. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael. And said to him, we found him who Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. You see, once people come to Jesus, Jesus opens their minds and their eyes and their hearts to, to who he is. So Nathaniel says to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I'm just not going to be a Messiah from Nazareth. Nazareth, come on, it's dumb. We're not going to, God would never use Nazareth. Philip said to him, Come and see. I know. I have felt the same way about the Bible, about God, about Jesus. It was silly most of my life. But I came and saw. And then on Easter Sunday, 1979, my eyes were open to the truth. So Jesus, verse 47, sees Nathaniel coming towards him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom was no deceit, can't fool Nathaniel. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. His eyes were open. And, and so he was simply brought. Come and see was the the great sermon that, that was preached to him by Philip. And Philip, later on, leads the Ethiopian to Christ. And Philip is one of the only men in the scriptures, if not the only man, who's uh, specifically identified as an evangelist. 
And his message was simple, come and see. And so as we go back to Chronicles, many people came and sought not the riches and wealth of Solomon, but the wisdom. There was just something different about him. And we understand that his wisdom came directly from God. I read Proverbs every day if I can possibly can. I'm pretty, I'm, uh, I'm pretty good at it, getting, getting it read every day. Um, because it's the wisdom of, of God through Solomon who he gave this gift of wisdom to. And people would come. We don't have to pay for it. We don't have to travel to get it. It's got right in our hands. I, I trust it, man. There's such practical godly wisdom in proverbs I, I trust you would read it every day um there's 31 proverbs and there's 31 days in most months so i always read the proverb in in connection with the day of the month today is the 11th and so i read proverbs 11 this morning it's just a simple way of reminding myself to to get that wisdom of god every day so as we go back, uh, we, we see that this is that come and see attitude. In John 4, um, you could turn back to Chronicles. But in John 4, Jesus met the woman at the well. He begins to tell her about her life and who he is. And so John 4, 28 says, The woman left her water pot, went into the city to tell the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the city and came to him, and many were saved. Some said, we were saved because of what you told us. Others says, we were saved because when we got here, we saw for ourselves that Jesus was the Christ. Come and see. Come and see. Jesus himself says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Just come. Uh, you've got to give Jesus at least the respect of, of, of giving him a chance in, in learning, reading for yourself. Don't believe in God because I tell you or some uh, person with a robe tells you and don't dismiss God because people tell you not to. Right? You're an intelligent, created in the image of God being who is fully capable of picking up a Bible, reading John chapter three, and then discerning for yourselves as God directs you, the truth of it. So come and see. So that's what she does. We go back to Second Chronicles. Um, she spoke with them all that was in her heart. Verse 2. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, the cupbearers and their apparel uh, by his entryway by which he was up the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. And so here is this queen, this queen of Sheba, who had all of her retinue and all of the other things that she brought with her. But the things of Solomon literally took her breath away. There's no more spirit in her. You know, whether she came to challenge him with these questions, whether she came to, uh, it was too good to be true that she thought. But the, the point was that by the time she got listening, he took her, her breath away. There was no more spirit in her. And sometimes our spirit of the man you know wrestles against god like jacob and, and and paul kicking against the goads the bible says in acts 9 until god breaks us down and and takes our breath away the the, the breath and awe of the things of god and the breath that would challenge god uh, with our own thoughts and, and ideas uh, so she said to the king, verse 5, this is a pretty incredible verse. It is a true report, which I heard from my own land, about your words and your wisdom. It sounds very similar to Nathaniel and to Philip and to Peter and to Andrew, who came to Jesus and, and 
went from teacher to Messiah. It's true. Everything I heard about you is true. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And that's what this witnessing is all about, this planting of the seeds. Uh, and we want to try to convert people with our fancy words and our fancy church services. Faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how will they know? How will they hear without a preacher? This is all in Romans 10. And that's what we do. And then all of a sudden, we want people not to be converted to some religious experience that wears off. We want them to see with their own eyes that the things of God in this word are true. And then in verse 6, she, she makes an incredible statement. She says, I came and saw you with my own eyes, and indeed, the half of your greatness of your wisdom was not told to me. You exceed the fame which I had heard. That old hymn, your, the half has never been told. He says, she says, I came here doubting you, and I'm going to leave here not only believing what was told me about you and about your God, but knowing that they didn't. Usually things are too good to be true. In her mindset, it, it wasn't half as good as, it, as it, the reality. That never happens. That the reality surpasses the, the stories. That's heaven. The Bible says that we right now are looking at God through a glass darkly, but someday we'll see him face to face. Half has never been told. Liz and I are doing a, a little uh, devotional on uh, on the new heaven and the new earth, and and uh, it's not a book I would recommend. Uh, I don't know that this author gets it right. For Liz and I, it's it's we can kind of discern, and nothing about it is is un theologically un incorrect. It's just we don't know. And so, oh, this person is kind of trying to think about what the new earth would be like. And Liz and I like to think beyond that. I like to think about life in eternity with no darkness and no sickness and no death. It's been a rough year for us. It's been really hard. And so we're, we're thinking about those things and people we love have died and other things are going on. And But you know what? <laughs> if everything in this little devotion is true, Man, what a glorious place heaven will be. But I know for a fact that this author has not even half of it right. Everything in there is probably true, but it's only half. When we get to heaven, the Bible says the, the, the sufferings of this world cannot compare with the glories that are awaiting us. Uh, we don't even know the half of it. And that's how it's going to be. So we just pray for our loved ones to be driven to Christ, to be drawn to Christ through uh, little seeds. Just come and see. Please read John chapter 3. Read John 3.16. Read the book of John. And it'll encourage you to keep reading. Uh, and then Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, the Trinity, they'll do the rest. They will do the rest. Verse 7 she says, happy are your men and happy are your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. That's us. Uh, you know, the, the blessings of God that people see drives them to what you have. That love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness. Blessed be the Lord God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne to be king for the Lord your God, because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. So who does she give credit to? She gives it to God. Does that mean she's a believer in God? It's hard to say through this. I mean, she does make reference to blessed be the Lord your God. So it's almost like it's you know, um, 
transferring it to, to Solomon. Um, doesn't say my God or the God, um, the God of Israel, she calls it. Um, but that's all through the scriptures that the Bible God talks about, especially in when it deals with Israel. He did this a lot in Exodus where he says, then they will know that I am God. Then they will know that I am God. And God uses either the wrath of enemies, punishment of followers, blessings of followers uh, to show his power that he is God. Deuteronomy 28 puts it this way. It'll come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. Verse 10 says, then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. So it's a really interesting testimony of God here in Deuteronomy 28. Um, that if Israel would keep the commandments, then all the people of the earth, verse 10 of Deuteronomy 28, will see that you were called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. We can, again, transfer that today, that, that either the blessings that God gives you or sometimes the challenges and trials that God gives you is a testimony to those around you um, constantly that will help draw uh, and that was the woman at the well, you know, come and see this man who told me everything about myself. What's interesting about the queen of Sheba is that God, Jesus himself uses her as an example. And it's an interesting example. Turn to Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, and we'll look at this. Um, we're going to look at verse 38. In Matthew 12, 38, the, the Pharisees are again challenging Jesus, and they want him to show them a sign to prove he's God, but they don't care that he's God. See, they're not seeking God for wisdom. They're not searching God for truth. They're, they're always trying to dis, dis, defame him. So verse 38 of Matthew 12, some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign shall be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what's that talking about? Well, the only sign that we need is the resurrection. Now, we've been 2,000 years since the resurrection, but it's historically proven that something happened, that there was a man named Jesus who died on a cross and the body disappeared. That's historically proven. So true is it that, that those who fight against it have all kinds of ridiculous reasons of what happened to the body. So just the fact that the enemies are trying to explain what happened to this missing body shows that history shows there was a missing body. And that resurrection was the final sign that anyone needed. Well, what do you need? Jesus died. They killed him. For three days, he lied in the tomb. And then he came back from the dead. Praise God victory in Jesus. That is our only evidence and only proof that we really need. So he looks at these men who seek a sign. He says, the resurrection is the only sign you're ever going to need. Now, obviously in Matthew 12, he hasn't, that hasn't happened yet. So he says, the, the sign of Jonah, Jonah was three days in the fish. He says, and he tells him exactly what's going to happen. This is, by the way, why the uh, Herod had the guards and Pilate had the guards outside the tomb to make sure no one stole the body and claimed that he rose from the dead. But look at verse 41. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. So now he uses not only the, 
the, the sign of Jonah in the fish, but the result of what Jonah did when he was uh, spit up by the fish, he preached to Nineveh, even though he didn't want to, and Nineveh repented. And he says, those people will be in judgment over you because they listened to Jonah and responded to Jonah. But a greater than Jonah is here. But look at the next verse, 42. The queen of the south, that's the queen of Sheba, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater then Solomon is here. Now, this, this queen, she came to see. She rose up out of this um, um, uh, far east and came to hear Solomon's wisdom. And greater than Solomon is here. Jesus himself, the son of God, is right before them. And they've rejected his teaching. And he says, you know, the Ninevites will have judgment over you, and the queen will have judgment over you. This gives us a, a, a kind of a, an idea that, that, that she perhaps did accept the God of Israel as being the true God, and that we may be in heaven with the queen of Sheba someday. I think it kind of points to that. Um, so the point there was, how dare you not? Listen to, at least give me a chance. The Ninevites listened to Jonah and Sheba listened to Solomon. And I'm greater than both. I'm greater than both. Why would you not listen to me? So Jesus even uses her as his example. Well, as we go back to Second Chronicles, and the rest of this chapter is is more inventory of what Solomon gained. And I don't want to lose the, the emphasis of the first part of this, but we'll walk through it. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, spices, and great abundance and precious stones. Verse 10, the servants of Hiram and the servants of Solomon who brought gold from Ophir, brought algum and wood and stones. Um, verse 12, Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked, much more than she brought to the king. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. So they, in those verses, exchange gifts, but Solomon makes sure whatever she gave, he would give more to her. And she left and we get no really word about her until we see that, that this meeting had a great impact on her according to Matthew 12. So then from chap verses 13 through um, 23, uh, we see a, a list of many of the articles and things that Solomon had gained. But there was an interesting verse 13 says, the weight of the gold that came to Solomon was 666 talents of gold yearly. Uh, so... I will tell you that I, I did a pretty deep study of that. It's the only other person in the Bible other than the Antichrist connected with the number 666. Um, I think there's significance to that, um, but I can't preach to the significance. I'll have to study it more. I tried to, to, to look, but it's just not, there, there's nothing in scripture to tell us why um, or if there's a connection um, but it is an inter interesting thing. Um, so verse 14, besides what the traveling merchants and the traders brought, all the kings of Arabia and the governors brought, um, just talking about all of the incredible material things that they had. Um, let's go down to uh, verse 22. So King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom wealth and wisdom. And the, the point is, which is more valuable? Um, all the kings of the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And we already talked about that, that, that they had come and seen. Now we have the testimony of the Queen of Sheba, we, but there was many more that the wealth 
simply drew people, but the wisdom was what they were really seeking. Because many of the people that came to him, including the queen, already had wealth. What they really wanted from Solomon was this wisdom. It was different than they never heard. Remember, many people said about Jesus, he speaks like no one we've ever heard before. And that's what the word of God will do. Verse 24, each man brought his present and articles of silver, gold, and garments, armor, spices, horses, mules at a rate every year. And so Solomon, verse 26, reigned over all the kings from the river to the land of Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common in Jerusalem as stones. So the wealth is beyond our imagination. What did it do for them? They didn't come for the wealth. They came for the wisdom. And verse 29 says, The rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the book of Nathan the prophet? And that's a, a book that we don't have access to. Um, but we see the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs. Um, in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilamite, and in the visions of Ido the seer, concerning Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat. So many people were writing about Solomon. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over Israel 40 years. Solomon rested with his fathers, was buried in the city of David, his fathers, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. And that's it. We end with this um, meeting with the Queen of Sheba, all of the material wealth that he had, and the incredible wisdom that people saw. But we also know that Solomon died separate from God in a way. I'm not saying that he wasn't a believer. Some would debate that. But he turned his back on God and, and followed foreign gods because of all of the wives, as God told him would happen for those who married foreign wives. And yet Chronicles doesn't even mention it. Just as Chronicles, when we went through the life of David, didn't mention Bathsheba or his sin. And who, the chronicler is, is, is writing in a whole different kind of a mindset of not a historical, but almost a spiritual realm. And Ezekiel chapter 33 says an interesting thing. When I say to the righteous that he will surely live, but he trusted his own righteousness and commits iniquity. None of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he's committed, he shall die. It's an interesting statement. Those who try to live on their own righteousness, we talked about this on Sunday morning, then their righteousnesses will not even be remembered. But only the, the, the evil works that was done. But look at the contrast, Ezekiel 33, 14. <laughs> Again, I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge and gives back what he has stolen and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live and not die. None of his sins he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what was lawful and right. He will surely live. And Jesus says in Hebrews, he remembers our sin no more. And so the wealth was what kind of caused the fall of Solomon. But God gives this great promise that, that if you will confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. And, and if you want to live by your own righteousness, then that righteousness is completely forgotten by God and only your sins remain. But if you confess your sins, then only what remains is, is that righteous knowledge. So I encourage you to come and see. Was Solomon a Christian? He ends Ecclesiastes with this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let each hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. This is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or or evil. So fear God and keep his commandments. That's that's Solomon's kind of final conclusion. There is good and evil. 
serve God, give your life to him. Your sins are as far as the east is to the west. Live righteous, forget God, and your sins are on the forefront. Which do you want? If you don't believe what I'm saying, come and see. Come and see. The book is available online anywhere. If you're watching this, you have access to scripture. Read the book of John. If you don't read the whole book, read John chapter 3. If you don't read the whole chapter, meditate on John 3.16. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, may those who are seeking you come and see in the scriptures what you have to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope you have a great week. We will talk to you soon.